Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to call the uh, meeting uh, of March 26 to order. If you'd all please rise for Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Butler, could you lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If we could all remain uh, standing for a moment of silence to honor our armed forces here and abroad. Thank you. Please be seated. <coughs> Looks like the uh, first order of business tonight will be uh, to elect a chair. And before I open it up uh, for nominations, I'd like to personally open up nominations by nominating Tom Dolan as chairman. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Any further nominations? Discussion. Discussion. Um, well, I, I, I uh, appreciate the, the sentiment uh, and also the fact that you accommodated uh, moving this this meeting to accommodate some of my business travel. I do appreciate that. Um, given my uh, current uh, uh, business schedule and, and travel commitments for the next few months, uh, and having been the chair for uh, two times in the past, I understand that the amount of time uh, to properly execute that duty is about 2x what a uh, regular counselor needs to spend time with the town manager and so forth. Um, I'm not sure I could do that position justice given my next uh, few months worth of travel. Uh, and if the uh, council is, is so uh, inclined, I would be happy to, to uh, entertain that uh, nomination maybe in next year or the year beyond. Uh, depending on the constitution of the council. Uh, so I would uh, respectfully request that uh, uh, I not be chair, uh, uh, given those circumstances that I've just described. Okay, Dave, so, since we have a uh, motion on the floor in a second, do we have to vote on it? Well, if the uh, second is withdrawn, then the, the motion okay. dies. Second. I withdraw. Okay. Do we hear any further nominations? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, nominate uh, John Farrell as chairman. I'll second that. Okay, is there any uh, other nominations? Hearing none, nominations are closed. All in favor of John Farrell for chair signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Hearing none, the vote is 5 to 0. Congratulations, Mr. Chairman. I don't know if that's congratulations or sympathies. <laughs> or sympathies. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, um, folks, moving along. Um, on the agenda this evening, past uh, the election of officers, we have the... Uh, Vice Chair. Oh, I apologize. Thank you. We have to Actually, we have to nominate a Vice Chair. So, if I could entertain um, nominations for a Vice Chair. Nominate Tom Dolan. Do I hear a second? I'll second that. Are there any other nominations? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Chair votes affirmative. The vote is 5-0. Oh, we need a clerk, too, don't we? Yeah, we haven't. The, the functions haven't been there for a clerk, but historically, the council does appoint a clerk. Would you gentlemen like to entertain a motion for a clerk, or would you like to just pass on that? It's your call. Whatever you pass. pass. Yeah, pass. We didn't have one last year. I don't think we really need one. Okay. Before. All right. Thank you. Um, elections of officers are closed. Um, let's move on to the next item on the agenda. Uh, scope and mission of the budget committee is what I, oh, excuse me, it's changed from what you have in front of me here. The town planning and urban design collaborative master plan process. Who will be presenting that this evening? I'll make the introduction to you on mine, Mr. Chairman. Certainly. Andre, keep in mind that you know me very well. All, all, all presentations, the average human, human, human attention span is eight minutes. Okay. <laughs> you just used about 30 seconds of mine, so I'm going to... There you go. Uh, uh, board, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to briefly uh, uh, introduce our planning consultant that will be helping us to update the... Uh, I should not update, but perform the comprehensive master plan update for the town of Londonderry uh, after a, um, a rigorous... Uh, uh, amount of proposals submitted, 
the master plan subcommittee uh, selected town planning and urban design to help us with the uh, update of the master plan. Uh, they are here tonight, uh, Mr. <coughs> Brian Wright, who is the principal of uh, TPUDC, as well as Kara Wilbur, um, just to give the uh, board an overview. And, and I believe there's several members of the planning, uh, planning board here tonight as well to listen in on this um, uh, overview, as well as uh, Letha Riley, who is the uh, chair of the comprehensive master plan. So um, without any further ado, I want to introduce Brian. So I'm not much of a sitter while I present. If you don't mind, I'll hold on to this. Um, Feel so, free. Yeah, so um, I've heard you guys are above average in Londonderry. So I have um, eight and a half minutes planned. So <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm just going to be casual and lean against this because it works well with the microphone. But uh, what I want to do is just go through a little bit um, of you know the project and get everybody up to speed, and, uh, and I'll go quickly. There we go. So... What we're trying to do is, is really take a, um, uh, a large uh, <coughs> zoomed out view of things, uh, looking at a holistic model, looking for connections, thinking outside the box, um, you know, trying to understand that there's an interconnection between technology, society, environment, and you know, all other aspects of things that go into the town here, uh, and looking for you know, the ways that these are all interconnected one to the next. Uh, so that will inform then the plan. Now, what we see in some cases are plans are set up um, so that they're a snapshot, a state of the union of, as to you know, what's going on today. Uh, and as you can see in the images here, not only does the Polaroid fade, but so do the fashions and styles. And so what we don't want to do is just say, here's what's happening today. Uh, and then you know, years later, we'll say, oh, how interesting. And then we won't look at the document anymore. Um, you know, in other cases, there are lots of speculations. Uh, here's what's happening in the future, and we, you know, sort of uh, look into our crystal ball, and the consultant tells you all kinds of wise things. Um, for me, I'll say, you know, I'm a, I'm a consultant. You don't hear many consultants say this much, but you know, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. The future is uncertain, and so we're going to look at some other things because what happens is, in some cases, uh, you know, it's not clear what's going on uh, when the future comes. Now. For us, what we like to do is focus on fundamental principles. We like to um, uh, look at those principles to test the future decisions that you guys are making, creating a toolkit um, to empower the citizens, the elected officials, development community to help um, to achieve a vision for the future. Uh, so focusing on the principles is a key thing. Now, a lot of people say, okay, well, how am I going to do this? Um, I need data, right? So let's just look and do research, and we'll get stacks and stacks of data. What happens is that data turns into piles, and then the next thing you know, you're drowning in data, and no one cares to look at the document anymore, and it becomes stale and sits on the shelf. Um, and so what we do is we take data, because uh, we're not saying, well, we don't need to know anything about the place. But we take data, and we try to turn it into something that is useful, uh, presentable, and um, accessible to everyone, including the general public uh, or elected officials or whatever. And so look, using a, a series of uh, what we call infographics here, this is actually a poster. Uh, and we took a multi-hundred page document and pulled out all the in relevant and interesting facts and put them into that document. Now, uh, in this case here, we're looking at demographics of a town, and so we can do it with a bunch of different types of data. What we found in one case is that they were missing a, 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 a demographic group in their population of the city. They had an imbalance. Uh, they had a particularly um, um, a large percentage of older people in the, in the community, and they didn't have people between the ages of 35 and, uh, or 25 and 35. Uh, who bring a lot of creativity, um, not that they're the only ones who are creative, but they bring a lot of creativity in the community we were working in particular wanted to focus on that and help uh, looking at you know, creativity as the um, uh, you know, currency of the future economy. So here we're looking at, um, what we, this is actually a real estate company called the Cool Space Locator, uh, and this is you know, evidence that the town that this is in actually has cool space where these types of people want to have their shops and businesses and do interesting things. In a lot of places, you couldn't have that real estate business because there's simply not enough cool space to do that. Um, here you can see in cool spaces, people like this guy, it's hard to see in the back, I'm sure, because the lights are on, but this guy is actually uh, working in his workshop on a wind turbine. Uh, so this would be a startup company um, and doing something very creative. The next thing you know, the startup company that was in his garage workshop now is making these massive wind turbines and green industry has come to his town. 
Uh, and so you start seeing documents like this talking about smart growth and smart economics and looking at all of the principles that go along with that that you may have heard about in the media uh, as being good for business. Now MSN put out a, uh, a study of the top 10 uh, factors of how happy your city is and good urban design uh, was one of those things. And so we're looking at uh, recognizing today that businesses want to go where place, places where their employees want to live. Uh, places where the employees will be happy. It's not just about, I want my business to be here and because my business is so awesome, anyone will come here. And so you have to set up the place to uh, encourage those types of things. Now, that said, we're talking about bringing in business and bringing in people um, and you know, looking at and recognizing what are the, the things that are important to those types of people and businesses that you're trying to attract. And something as simple as a buy fresh, buy local campaign can begin to <coughs> create that environment to bring those types of people, that bring those types of businesses, et cetera. So you wouldn't think about you know, Farm Fresh as a concept for economic development in the future. Now, what we're going to do is be doing, conducting a series of analyses, you know, transportation analysis, economic analysis, um, that goes on to a, um, a big design workshop and we're looking at here um, the opening presentation where it'll be set up. Everything's open to the public. This is a week-long process um, where people come in and share their ideas. The design team, my team, comes in from all around the country uh, and gives, um, you know, sets up our office, and you'll see that uh, here. Uh, we have these breakout meetings um, with specific topics uh, that go on throughout the week. And then we have an interim presentation where we say, here's what we've heard so far from you guys. Uh, are we getting it right? Here's what we've done as a result of what you've told us. Are we on the right path? Do we need to readjust? Uh, and so we don't get too far down the road. Here you can see this was an abandoned storefront uh, before our team came. This is actually uh, our team set up an office here, um, brought in all the equipment, and we're going to be doing that uh, here in town. Uh, and then production happening, designers and uh, engineers and artists and everybody all the while listening to what's going on. And then a closing presentation, which is the end of the design week, but it's not the end of the whole process. So you'll see lots of this going on too. What happens is we are um, you know, working uh, morning, noon, and night. And so if you find people under the tables asleep, don't call the police, it's okay. Um, they're supposed to be there. Um, what we've got so far, because we want to get the word out, you know, bringing my team in is, is important and all of that. But the most important thing is to hear from the community, from you guys, um, from the elected officials, appointed officials, and everybody who knows this place in a way that we can never know it as outsiders. Um, so we bring our professional expertise, and you guys bring your local expertise, and all together we do that. So we've created a Facebook page. Uh, this is the address up here, facebook.com slash pages slash londonderry dash master dash plan. Uh, you can go there, and all of the information throughout the project will be updated, um, d drawings and um, reports, and uh, people can post ideas, and all of that is up there. Uh, so we need to get people to go to that. Now, that's fine and to get everybody to come out and, and you guys to, to tell you know, what you think ought to be in the future. Um, but what we need to make sure is that the plan is then implemented and executed because it comes down to you know, city council, uh, town council, being able to you know, actually make these things, uh, allow these things to happen. Uh, and so as a result, we're going through and uh, doing lots of hands-on things in the community and with the elected and appointed officials. But what we need are champions, um, and for those who are too young to know, this is Freddie Mercury and these things. We're the champions and all that. So, um, but we need champions to come out and really support this and say, look, you know, this is important to us. This is the future of our town, and we need to all of you to come out and participate, uh, and rather than leaving it up to us. So this is what we're calling it. Um, your comprehensive plan is called Get It Right Londonderry. Um, and so we really want to, you know, kind of a little bit bold, a little bit, you know, in your face. Um, but at the same time, I think you guys are, you know, tough enough to handle that. Because I've heard over and over, you guys want to get it right. You're, the future is important to you. So this is the, uh, in a nutshell, in a eight and a half minutes, uh, what we're planning on doing. So uh, that's it. That the fastest presentation I've ever given. <laughs> well, 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 thank you. Um, I'm sorry about that phone call, folks. The end of the quarter for me. And work call, so I apologize. Um, gentlemen, do you have any questions? I guess uh, since I'm at this end, we'll start at the other end. Nope, I'm all set. Joe? I'm all set. Fine. Uh, uh, just a little bit of coaching. Uh, I would, uh, as, as, uh, as you, want, you want the community to warm up this process, good presentation, I would, I would try to strike the words urban and city <coughs> out of your vernacular when you, because it, it particularly chafes in this community. It's a, it's a characteristic of the town, so just a word to the wise so you don't run into that uh, 
uh, in the hallway. Thank you. That's, those are those local things that I'm talking about. We need your help to make sure we don't stumble on this landmine. So thank you. Um, thank you. Um, there, there was a gentleman who came here a couple of years ago and decided to tell us who we were. That, that didn't go over really well, and it wasn't in a master planning process. It was in a charrette by a private developer, and he decided he, he, he knew what was best. By the way, he hasn't been back. So um, I know that you want to interview all of us. I don't know if, if we've been very cooperative thus far. I know that I haven't been. <laughs> so I'll only speak for myself. So um, if, if Cynthia could make sure that any of us who have been missing or any information that you need, then we make sure we follow up on that and, and get ourselves available. As well as um, you know, the planning board, the uh, you know the other boards in town. There's a, there's a ton of information. Uh, one thing I've always stressed to people is that we have this organization called LAFA, and it's the London Dairy Athletic and Field Association. And they're right behind us. There'll be 1,400 kids, you know, playing softball and baseball, and there'll be 3,000 parents. And they're the people who really matter. So if somebody went and talked to them, that might be a good idea. If, you know, on, on a Saturday opening day which is three or four weeks from now, if, if you had something that you could share so that people could, you know, give you their input, might be helpful. Do you think I could, like, sing the national anthem and take a throw off first pitch and then give a full presentation? Joe's in Laffey. You'll have to talk to him about that. <laughs> yeah, and I think we're going to change, you know, you saw the word charrette up there. I think, you know, based on what you just said, um, we're thinking about changing it to plan a palooza instead of charrette. So... You, you work that stuff out with Andre. I think Andre likes charrette. <laughs> but is there anything else? Um, we are in public comment, folks, so you know, I would entertain if there are any of you here who have any comment on the presentation. Not seeing any, we'll go ahead and move on. Um, the next piece is um, interviews for the Manchester Airport Authority. Are those candidates here this evening? Yes, sir. Please come forward, state your name for the record and your address, please. My name is Nick Codner. I live at 162 Litchfield Road. Hi, Mr. Codner. How are you? I'm just great. How about you? Terrific. I know that I've, we've all received some information on you. If it's okay <coughs> with you, what we'd like to do is, is um, we'll go through the board, see if anybody has any questions, okay. and, uh, and then we'll go from there. Would that be all right? Sure. Start at the other end again if you're comfortable with that, Jim. I know it's your first meeting, but uh, you just happen to be at the other end. I have to <laughs> set up. Uh, I just got this this afternoon, so you have to bear with me. Uh, you have a pilot's license, I see. Yes, yeah, since 1987. A, pardon me? Since 1987. Since 1987. So you're familiar with the Manchester Airport, I assume that's. I've had an airplane tied down at the uh, Manchester Airport since 1989. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I guess uh, the same question I asked all the other candidates was, uh, what uh, uh, characteristics do you uh, have that would uh, stand out and, uh, I'll, you know, get my vote for uh, you being the Manchester Airport representative? Well, I've been a resident of London Dairy since 1974, so I've um, I own a construction company too, so I've taken part in a lot of the development that's happened in this town. Um, I built the wood part on the uh, bandstand when the building inspector asked me to be civic-minded. Um, <coughs> as well as seeing all the, uh, the growth in town over the years, which um, depend on which way you look at it, a lot of the people who were here then would look and say, we're not happy with it because we liked it when it was woods. <coughs> but I think that the, uh, the growth in this town has been managed very well. Um, we have a class A school system and the town is well maintained. So I think it's done well. I'm a neighbor to the airport. I can see the airport from the back of my property, um, as well as being an aviation enthusiast. I'm a, I'm a close neighbor to them. They fly over my house when the winds are from the south. Um, a lot of people don't realize two-thirds of the airport is in Londonderry, so we have a tax base, and we have a potential for a lot more tax base around the airport so long as it's managed right, which I think it will be. Um, we've been good neighbors, and I think that the airport has tried to be a good neighbor. I remember in the 1990s when some of the planes were pretty loud, <coughs> and the airport would encourage people to call. If a plane came over the house and made too much noise, they wanted to hear about it. And so I think that they strive to be good neighbors as well as Londonderry, and uh, I'd like to see that stay that way. Um, 
I would see my job as being a liaison between the town council and the airport administration to keep the town council appraised of the direction and intent of the airport and at the same time informing the airport administration of any concerns that the town has. Thank you. Tom. Oh, um, thank you, Mr. Codner. Uh, since you're a neighbor there, what, uh, what are your views on any further airport expansion? Um, I don't think you're going to see much more airport uh, expansion as far as the runways. They're pretty much as big as they're going to get. Um, the expansion you'll see is in the industry around the airport, and most of that is going to be in Londonderry. And I don't know if most people in town realize it, but industry is great for the town. It pays a lot of taxes and doesn't send one kid to school. And he has very few services. So it's beneficial to the town to have the airport industry, the industry around the airport expand. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Codner, for, uh, for volunteering. I, I want to continue on that theme about uh, in and around the airport development. I, I, you know, as you seem to uh, have a good grasp on that, uh, that industrial land there is the largest piece of indus undeveloped industrial land left in the state, and it's a jewel in the state, and it's with its transportation network around it, <coughs> and its location uh, close to Massachusetts and so forth. Uh, I think we realize that in order to get that developed and to just start generating that tax revenue, we need to be partnering with the airport, the airport authority, city of Manchester, and the landowners and so forth. Uh, do you see this, this appointment would be um, uh, uh, as part of that uh, development uh, and as, as part of helping uh, uh, the airport authority understand what our wishes would be and, and how we can work together with the airport authority for that development uh, I think it would be exactly that that would be part of the job. Yes um, I know that there's there's going to be uh, a lot more involved in just wishing it happens uh, I know the town is is looking to try and get some federal grant money to help with um, the roadways through the industrial park uh, it'll be a ways in the future Hopefully not too far. Um, but yeah, I would uh, like to keep both sides, the administration and the uh, town council, connected. Good, thank you. Um, Mr. Cogner, so currently I'm the, um, the uh, liaison from the council to the airport. Doesn't really mean I sit on the board, actually. When they have a meeting, I sit in the audience, yeah. along with some other officials from Manchester and from the state. Um, I did speak with Mark Brewer. Have you um, have you met Mark, who's the airport I, director? <clears throat> no, I haven't met Mark. I I used to um, have more to do with uh, Marianne Spink. Okay. Now uh, I deal with Matt Smith. He's in security. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just there today to uh, see about moving uh, my airplane out of the hangar into the tie down. Okay. Um, okay. So what Mr. Brewer explained to me is you know as part of how he goes about. Um, with a recommendation. So what we do is we make a recommendation, and then he takes that recommendation and takes it to the alderman in um, in Manchester, and then they do the actual appointment. Right. And then you know, um, so generally, probably whoever we recommend, Mark's going to want to meet and want to talk to. Yeah. Um, what he expressed to me when I spoke with him was is that you know he is looking for people who have a lot of experience and interaction with the airport over the years. Um, the, the airport is one of the three large landowners up there. So they're looking to develop their land as well. So um, do you have any, uh, I don't have any additional questions for you. I think the counselors have asked you the questions that need to be asked. Do you have anything for us? No, no, I think that's about it. <clears throat> anything else, gentlemen? Thank you, Mr. Codner. We'll be, um, we, it's not on our agenda vote tonight, but we will be getting back to you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, Margo, I believe we have one other gentleman, Mr. Mike Boyle, yes. is that correct? Evening, Mr. Boyle, how are you? I'm fine. It's Mike Boyle, um, 6 Angelo Lane, Londonderry, New Hampshire. Thank you. I'm going to uh, start at the other end again and put the, the rookie counselor on the yeah, spot. On the spot. <laughs> I love you, Johnny. Okay. <laughs> do you want, I'm only going to do it to you for part of the night. I'm going to start back over here later. <laughs> uh, Mike, uh, what's your view with regards to the development up by the airport and your view on the Pettengill Road project? Um, let's see. For, first and foremost, it's an 
awesome way for me to get back and forth to Concord now, coming um, from that way. So the bridge has done a, a great job. Um, and then when we get the other road finished, what would that one be? The Pettingale, the one that connects down to the light? That's going to be even better. So um, the transportation across Route 3 and um, for the other people other than LAF, for the people that are in lacrosse and soccer that play over in the field in Bedford, um, it's a great way to get across there which is also, I guess, going to bring a lot of people across into that industrial area when it gets built. So the infrastructure was one of the most important things that happened. Uh, the infrastructure on the runways um, was another important thing, getting larger airplanes, more people, um, more directions um, for landing and taking off. So that infrastructure, excuse me, uh, you got to sit close, huh? That infrastructure uh, is going to be, just from listening to you guys and uh, listen to the school board and listen to the people at the school is going to be um, a great uh, godsend uh, for Londonderry when we get that up and running as it goes along. Thank you. Did, did I answer that okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Joe? So my question again is uh, what special characteristic or qual qualification uh, do you bring to the table that will uh, uh, swing my vote to you? I, uh, let's see. So I ran for the school board and now I'm going to try for this one. And when I start um, coming to these things and practicing and, and, and looking to volunteer my time, I see an amazing amount of people that you all have um, to help you out. Um, the list of their qualifications. Um, so how do I add to that? Um, I've been a member of, uh, I've been in this town since I was a young man. I grew up in Derry. Um, my wife grew up in this town, so we're actual um, long-term residents. My kids went to school, my wife went to school here. Um, I've been in the military um, as a pilot since I was a young man for about 30 years, um, just getting ready to retire. I started landing at the Manchester Airport in 1986 in a Huey. I've been in there on a Saab 340 for Business Express Airlines. I have been in there in a BK-117 for Boston Med Flight. I've been in there a, Dolph a Dolphin, which is another helicopter for Boston Med Flight. And most recently over the last uh, 14 years in a King Air 200. Um, I've got a commercial um, uh, twin engine license. I've got an ATP and a helicopter. So I've got, I've been around for a while flying. And I'm very familiar with the airport. Um, I've helped them with some um, things that have showed up wrong on approach plates and things like that. Um, so I think those are some of the qualifications I bring. Um, I'm retiring from the military. Got a little free time, although my wife wants me to get to work, but um, we'll figure that out as we go I along. I need to do list as long. Thanks, I yeah, No, it's not that long. She wants me out of the house and, and uh, <laughs> I can work. So. Um, Good for you. <laughs> I, so I think those are some of the qualifications, and I don't want to drag on too long, but I think uh, did I answer that question <coughs> adequately for you? Thank you. Hi, Tom. Oh, oh. thanks. I have no questions. Sir. No questions. Tom. I got two times in a row here. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks for volunteering, and thanks for stepping up the school board as well. Thanks, Tom, and you also. Um, uh, Jim asked, Jim Butler asked my, the question I was going to ask. I'm going to ask you a different question. Okay. Uh, so, you, so you've used the airport as a, a fixed wing pilot before. Now, and when you're landing from um, south to north, uh, and as I assume you, you line up your approach kind of right along High Range Road. Yes. Uh, what, what, what as a pilot? can be done to help mitigate some of the noise that those residents uh, experience as, as part of their geography that's uh, co-located near that runway. But what, what can the pilots do, if anything? What, what can they do to help mitigate some of the noise? Well, I think you've, you've hit on most of the things in just a couple of interviews. Um, there is a straight line to come in. The bigger jets have to come over the sawmill, um, which is five miles out. Um, so uh, what's that, what's his guy, what's their name down there at the sawmill on Estes down by the fire station? Um, that's part of what they did. Um, part of what they did is with new equipment, um, as the gentleman was talking about before, um, the hush kits, newer motors, they also become more gas efficient, so they solve two problems at the same time. Um, smaller pilots, twin engine airplanes, um, there are ways to um, bring the props for those that are left um, up to their full RPM at a later time higher approaches. Um, I think you've seen um, most of the 
modifications and techniques that you're going to see. Every once in a while, someone's in a hurry from Southwest or somebody else, and they want to make a shortcut and goes over somebody else's house, you know, that they're not normally gone over. Um, so I don't know if there's a whole lot of changes. Now, again, you know, well, I assume you know that um, the airport uses different runways on different days when they can, according to the winds. If the winds are, are light enough, they'll bring everybody over uh, Merrimack and Bedford on Sunday morning and, and uh, Friday night, everybody down runway 35 over Dan Beaver's house, so. I know most of the, uh, the, this, the technology in the 727s has been uh, uh, decommissioned and some of those real loud engines are, are few and far between these days. Right, and most of those companies that are using those airplanes will put something called what we used to call a hush kit on right. them, so um, mostly cargo. Um, most of the other guys that are carrying passengers and paying for seat miles are using newer engines that are quieter and more gas efficient. Okay. No, it's, it's all, always interesting to hear some of the science behind uh, some of the noise and, and how we mitigate it and how we uh, really try to, to help the residents there. Because it, it is a burden, especially when they're, when they're in the warm weather and their windows are open. Yep. Um, so I appreciate it. Thank you again for stepping up. So, um, so, Mike, you heard what I said to uh, Mr. Codner yeah. with regards to, Mr. to Mark Brewer. Have yeah, it's Mark? very. Uh, no, I have not. It's very interesting, though. I, I did. Uh, uh, I gave my dad a, a book a couple of years ago. Um, he actually worked at the Manchester Airport in the late '40s as a mechanic for the National Guard, and then he flew there in an L-19 in about 1957 when he got his license um, from the military, also. Um, so um, I've been reading a little bit about it, and uh, it's got some stuff about the board. It's a pretty interesting process up there, and, uh, and, and a lot of real estate, and a lot of taxes, and a lot of money. So it's, it's a fairly important position, even though it's a voluntary board. So I can understand how Manchester would really want to um, have you know, that control and that say over it. But also, I think it's super important that, um, like the gentleman said before, two-thirds of that airport um, lie on our property. So I think it's important for us to be, uh, you know, for you all to select the best person and, uh, and go up there and, and uh, deal with that thing. Yeah, the, the one thing, a couple of the things that Mark always communicates is, is that one is it's all about putting business passengers in seats. Seat miles, yep. So right now that, that's, that's an issue that we don't really have, you know, it, we, we can fill up all the airplanes we want going to Florida, but we're not putting enough business passengers in the seats. So we've got to develop land and bring in more business passengers. Um, what I would uh, I don't really, you know, the questions were answered, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I want to thank you yes. and, and appreciate your time. I also want to let you know, Margo, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's openings on the ZBA and on the planning board as well. <laughs> so if you're really looking for something to do with your time, yeah. <laughs> well, little, little, little campaign, <laughs> campaign stomp here for, for Margo. Yeah. I'm, I've been on the Recreation Commission for almost 10 years now, I think, or maybe a little bit more. So uh, I have a little bit more time. So I'm getting started in this process, and I'm looking forward to it. And... Uh, actually thinking about uh, looking forward uh, to the fall um, um, for a state rep or something like that also. So Outstanding. Yeah. Thank you very much right, for coming Thank you in. for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, gentlemen, if you'll, if you'll con if you, uh, concur, I'll ask Dave to move an um, appointment to our next meeting. Sure. Sure. All right. Thank you to all those who came in and interviewed. Um, our next item on the agenda, oh, excuse me. Yes, certainly. Okay, Dottie, if you could just please state name and address for the record, please. Sure. Dottie Grover, 537 Mammoth Road. And, John, I'm here to tell you that I did not keep my promise. I told you you'd be the second person to know when I decided what my retirement date would be. And I chucked it over the puppy first. She's pretty excited. <laughs> Okay, Dottie. I have uh, I've talked to family and friends and looked at all of my options and uh, decided that June 30th is going to be a good day for me. And that will be my official retirement day. A um, number of things have come together to make that work out well, um, health issues being one of them. And I have no intentions of going away away. I think I can uh, have some fun over there and do some of those programs that I've thought about for all these years and had to sit back on. So I just wanted you all to know that um, the retirement will be official on June 30th. And Dave, I know I need to give you something in writing for that too. So. Well, Dottie, let me be the first to congratulate you on your retirement. 
Thank you. Know, you. Um, you know, uh, I think I can speak for the council in wishing you well and I thanking you for your many, many years of service and everything that you've done for this community. You have done some great things to bring that program forward. I think there's a lot of people who really appreciate the time and the effort that you've put in. And in my mind, you've done all the right things in bringing that, for that program forward for the children of this community. I and appreciate it's hearing that. Thank you. Thank and, you. Um, it's been a passion, not a job, so it makes it a lot easier. Fantastic. And, and Dave, if there's anything that you know, we need to do to assist in any way, if you can let us know. I will. Sure. And, and gentlemen, if you have um, any comment for, for Dottie, Tom Dolan. I just wanted to also add my congratulations and, for, and uh, thank you for your service to the community. All, going back all the way, a lot of people don't, may not remember your years on the school board as well. So uh, again, thank you, Dottie. Yes, you can sincerely. thank John Jobin. He got me started down at North School. Okay. Same so. here, Dottie. Congratulations and enjoy your thank retirement. You, Appreciate it. Well, Dottie, congratulations. And uh, even though I just started working with you, uh, you've been very helpful to have me understand uh, the inner in workings of uh, the uh, cable studio. And um, um, you'll be missed. And uh, thank you for all your leadership. I was um, happy to do it, and I hope that some of you will go ahead and start doing some programming over there. Yep, and and if you ever need any help, call me to volunteer. The programming is great, and uh, it's, it's wonderful what you do for the young kids. So thank you. Thank you very much, you. and uh, congratulations. Thank you very much. Congratulations, and you're right about one thing. It's passion that, that it drove is. you. It's passion. I and congratulations tell. to you, too, Mr. Thank Butler. you very much. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Dottie. Folks, we're at the, uh, at, at the end of public comment here. Is there anyone else who would like to come up to the microphone during public comment? Okay, seeing no one else, we're going to go ahead and move on. Um, I'd entertain a motion to open a public hearing. So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The chair votes in the affirmative. We're 501 public hearing. Uh, folks, we're going to start off with resolution 201202 relative to the renaming of Kelly Road. Um, I'll entertain a motion to uh, waive reading. So motion. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Chair votes affirmative. We are 5-0 on waiving reading. Ladies and gentlemen, what this is about is, is that we are talking about, and I know a number of you are here and would like to speak to this, is the renaming of, of Kelly Road. We have two Kelly Roads in town, one with an E, one without an E. Um, I've done, since you've been here last, I personally have have uh, done um, excuse, without two E's, excuse me. Pardon me. Um, and you should be because it is part of your identity and I believe in that. I absolutely believe in that it is part of a person's identity, their address is part of their identity and I will tell you personally I have a lot of problems with this whole thing. And I expressed that to a number of people and everything and, and then I got told I have to talk to the lawyer. So um, we can go into all of that and all of the legal pieces that we've been advised about, but what I would like to do is, with your, um, is move through the council, um, also invite the, um, the task force forward um, to the microphones, and then go ahead and hear from you. But I'll move through the council first. Karen, if you want to come forward. John, Brian, and um, wherever is convenient for you, perhaps over here and one in the middle and then go ahead and hear from the residences. I think, gentlemen, you're familiar with this resolution. Do you have any further comment before I move to the residences? No. I don't like to hear from the residences. You. I, I have a question. It's kind of a technical question, I guess. Sure. Um, right now, how it's named, I imagine it's in my GPS system and most people's GPS system. And if most people are like me that never update their GPS system, when you change this thing, am I going to know that or not? No, unless you're current on the updates to the GPS. No, you won't know it. We, we do provide, uh, provide updates to the, uh, to the producers, the GPS uh, providers, so that the information in their master database uh, remains current. But again, uh, unless you uh, actively go ahead and, and update the GPS, it won't get corrected. Uh, I'll tell you, Tom, that most of the new GPSs on the market now contain an auto-update system. Okay, but again, if you purchased one prior to uh, you know, pretty much 2011, that uh, would be something you'd have to manually update. Okay, thank you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to come to the microphone, please identify yourself with your name and your address, and please state um, what comments you would like to make, because we would like to hear them. Actually, uh, Mr. Farrell, can I uh, yes. uh, offer something? Uh, 
Just a uh, one, one thing, uh, Mr. Chairman, to correct the record. Uh, there was a question last week about um, a letter from Mrs. Beal regarding the historical nature of Kelly Road. Yes, thank um, you. Just wanted to state that we did receive, we were able to locate that record. Mrs. Beal identified one property in uh, Kelly Road that was built in 1851. Um, we later found out that uh, the Kelly family purchased it in 1920. Uh, I went through the Historic Properties Task Force and there were, there were two properties that uh, were deemed historical importance on uh, Kelly Road. But again, uh, what we identified is that the, uh, the name Kelly appeared to have purchased the property in 1920. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes. Is the, uh, are we all aware that the, uh, the airport has taken a position as well? There's a, there's a recent letter. I don't know if it was in time for the last meeting, but is it? Um, actually, we did review that at the last meeting. We okay. reviewed that it is the staging positions of the airport and that it flows over into Manchester. And I guess as recently as two days ago, that actual um, staging positions were used for an aircraft that was coming in. That's Kelly Avenue, right? Right. Yeah. Not, right, not Kelly Road, right. Kelly Avenue. Yeah. Yeah, just, the, uh, just for your information, the map <coughs> on the wall, um, of course, Kelly Ave runs north and south alongside the runway. Again, it's uh, split both between uh, Londonderry and Manchester. Uh, Kelly Road that we're suggesting be changed runs south off of, uh, off of Litchfield Road. Um, again, Mr. Chairman, for the, uh, for the record, if I may, uh, we did receive, I, I don't know if it went around to your packets, we did receive a uh, uh, petition that was submitted by, by one of the residents. I can, uh, I can turn it in at the end of the meeting if you'd like. Can we see uh, it now, please? Excuse me? Can we see it now, please? Yes. Yeah, this was signed by 100% of the residents uh, in opposition to our recommendation. Thank you. I can come back to me. John, do you have anything else? I think that, uh, again, the, uh, our motivation for the, this recommendation stems from a letter the town received in uh, 2009 identifying uh, numerous roads that were inconsistent with uh, 911 naming standards. And we've worked through that list, uh, correcting a number of streets. Uh, we've corrected uh, change addresses for more than uh, 400 properties now. Uh, I'm happy to say that the changes we made to Whispering Pines in particular have been extremely productive. Um, my understanding is that uh, they've been uh, um, very positive changes and really facilitated the provision of emergency services. Um, again, uh, the uh, task force was established to uh, correct uh, known errors. Uh, if known errors are not acted upon, my understanding is that it becomes a liability if, if there is uh, um, fatalities or injuries that that, that uh, come from delay. All right, perhaps we can stop there for a moment. Dave, could you, um, I think you discussed the particular case with me that you made me familiar with. Yeah, it uh, came from the town of Swansea, uh, I believe about 10 years ago, in which there was an emergency and there was a, a, a number of different sections of road name, had the same name. Uh, they went to the, uh, as I understand it, the wrong address and uh, you know, as a result of the emergency, somebody did perish, and so the town was uh, found to be held liable in that they knew that there was a potential conflict which would result in uh, public safety services arriving either at a wrong address or late. Uh, so, so obviously every case has its own particulars, but uh, the standard has been established in New Hampshire whereby that the town is required or strongly advised that they have a responsibility to address these uh, these conflicting names, and that's why the staff brought it uh, before the council this evening. Okay. Is there anything else? Yes, Brian. Yeah. Um, last <coughs> time we discussed the Kelly Road, Kelly Ave. Um, the question came up of has there been confusion in the past? Um, at the time, to my knowledge, to uh, communication supervisor Bob Jones, there hadn't been any confusion. Um, speaking with some of the captains on the department, um, they did bring up a few instances where there has been confusion. Uh, one that um, Captain Cardwell was going to speak on tonight, unfortunately he is sick. Uh, back in September 1st of 2008, uh, we had multiple calls going on, um, multiple pieces out on 93. 
we had a brush fire on Kelly Road. The call came in, it was dispatched to Kelly Road, and the captain actually came off the highway to go to Kelly Road for the brush fire. When he showed up, um, found the brush fire, got the location, waited for the engine to show up. Um, some time had passed, he called for the engine, they said, just turning on to Kelly Ave now. He's on Kelly Road waiting for the engine. They had to turn around and come back, so it did delay the response. And we also discussed with other communities, mutual aid, um, as you know, are the staging areas for PD and fire, EMS are on Kelly Ave. They're very familiar with that. And changing Kelly Ave might lead to some confusion in responses to the airport, whether it be an alert one, um, we are quite busier medical calls. Uh, we're using Bedford, Derry, other ambulance services to come to the Manchester Airport to assist us. And sometimes, depending, you know, where it is in the airport, Kelly, the Kelly Ave gate is our access to the runways. Thank you. Any further comment from staff? Anything further from the council? Tom. Uh, John, where did the uh, suggestion for Horizon Road originate from? Uh, the name Horizon originated from the, from the residents. The, uh, this has been, uh, it's, I, I think, you know, all, all, all members of the task force, we're proud it's been an open process. We, we started this uh, uh, back in August. Uh, we held two public workshops with the residents. I think uh, all of you, all of, uh, all the residents uh, participated in those workshops. Um, at the last one, one of the residents uh, uh, opted to, um, to uh, canvas the neighborhood and look for uh, alternate names. Uh, one of the names that appeared to rise to the top was Horizon. Uh, we chose that. Um, I think that um, it, it did not receive a plurality. The only name that received a plurality was, was Kelly Road. Uh, but again, given the, uh, given the names that were suggested, we thought Horizon Road would the, fit the bill. And the, peti the petition that was just brought forth as 100% uh, for Kelly Road. Is Correct. So if there are some residents in favor of Horizon, does that mean that the petition is not all-inclusive or some people change their mind? Or? No, I think that um, I think the residents could speak to it, but I, I think that there's, uh, there's uniform opposition. I think that, uh, again, the question we asked is, is are there other names you would accept? Um, again, Horizon Road, uh, Horizon Road seemed to appear. I did see in there also that Stagecoach Road was a... Stagecoach was the first recommendation that we submitted. Um, the, uh, the history of the street, it, it was uh, previously a Stagecoach Road that would run north and south through Londonderry. So we suggested that as an alternate name. Uh, it wasn't received warmly, so we... we I moved. did notice that on one of the signed documents that one of the residents uh, offered that as an alternative as well. Correct. Yeah, another uh, suggestion that was uh, offered was... Uh, was Delp Road, and uh, that one again we uh, we we uh, opted to go with Horizon instead. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yes, Tom. Dave. Um, besides the uh, uh, lawyer advising about the Swansea case, has the insurer for the town said anything of about declining coverage? If we don't take action on this uh, we I've not had that conversation and uh, we can follow up on that but uh, again to date we've not received any conversation had any conversations about insurance carrier in that particular issue okay thanks Joe so because this is a liability question um, is it uh, beyond the scope of reasoning that we would ask the residents to sign a waiver um, possibly to uh, not hold the town responsible if there be a, was an emergency or or something that of that nature that would um, confuse, you know, the 911 call. Yeah, I'd have to carry that question forward to our liability carrier and their counsel to see whether there's any benefit in, in considering that idea. I just don't know at this point. And the, the question obviously is, is safety, and that's really what mm -hmm. why the concerns on the table in the first place. I mean, as uh, Mr. Chairman alluded to, it's 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 an identity issue for the residents, but for the town, it's a liability issue and a safety issue. What if one doesn't sign? You know, if ninety percent of them sign, but you know, ten percent don't. Right. Or if a new homeowner comes in and they don't want to sign. Yeah, I think we should get advice from legal. Okay. 
Ladies and gentlemen, you've come down here this evening. Um, we would like to hear from you if you would like to speak to us. And if you'd like to come to the microphone, identify yourself and, and your current address. Um, we would appreciate it. Yes, Good evening. My name is Ryder Daniels, and I live at 22 uh, Kelly Road. Uh, thank you very much uh, for hearing the comments this evening. I wanted to thank uh, John Vogel and the team for all the work that they've done in, in putting this together. We understand that this is an attempt to, uh, to make things safer for all of us and, and a tough job for everyone to do. Um, I will definitely stick under my eight-minute warning rule. Um, thank you for that <laughs> advice. I will, I, will, uh, I will speak quickly, but I do want to go over some <coughs> important points. Uh, so first of all, I think in the case that was, that was mentioned in New Hampshire, which I also read, the issue of liability was that the street signs were out of date. That was another part of it, where they said that the town had a requirement to make the street signs and that the trucks from, fire trucks from out of the town area who wouldn't know the town came and followed street signs that had long since been out of date. So I think we can all understand risk management and looking at liability, but I think we also have to look at facts and we have to look at that liability can't go to zero. Um, and so that's something I wanted to mention in that case. I believe you passed out those cases, John, in our first meeting to help educate us because we all want to be safer. So I think, I don't think you're going to hear from anybody tonight on the road who's here making an argument that, oh, change is bad. We just don't like change. I think we took this seriously. We all thought about it. We all looked at the safety issue. But we'd like to make a few arguments here at looking at the actual details, not the philosophy of safety or the philosophy of, of, of legal issues, but rather the practical legal issues, which is there will always be concern. As long as there are people calling and people interpreting those calls, there will always be a particular issue uh, of safety. Uh, and we can go through a, a couple of those points now. You, you know, so one is, it's not as if we have two Kelly Roads that are residential of the same attribute close by where logical confu uh, you know, confusion could occur. We also have to look at the difference between objective and subjective, right? This is entirely a subjective issue when we place a call to 911. It's not objective. And, and the case in point here is that Kelly Road is off of Litchfield Road. There's also a town Litchfield. When I call 911 and said, I have, I've had an accident, Litchfield, do you ask me, am I in Litchfield or Litchfield Road? What about streets that rhyme? This goes on and on to infinite, to n conclusions about whether or not we can be 100% safe. And then I, I what? I, I file a case if you don't come quickly enough that you should have known I was in Litchfield versus Litchfield or a street that rhymes. This gets to the point where in our effort to prevent lawsuits and to create the appearance of safety, we're actually no safer through this, right? There's, Kelly is a very common name, and that spelling, E-Y, is very common in here. I also note that none of the current GPS systems are confused. I have Google right here. When I type in Kelly, both Google, Microsoft, Bing, the, the Apple Map application, they all view Kelly as in Manchester because most of that road is in Manchester. And so it, where is the confusion coming from, right? And, and what, are, what is the problem we're actually trying to solve here? And are we really any safer by doing this? Um, from our understanding from the residents, we've only lived there seven years. A lot of folks have been there a long time who, who may speak this evening. But there's been two fires. There hasn't been any confusion that we know of, the, the two house fires that occurred. So I work at home. I had no idea there was a brush fire. It's a good thing, too. I might have run out of the house. So I, I, I don't know what brush fire it was. but but. Um, I, I'm, I must have blacked out that day or something, but I, I don't remember their one uh, being up there. So again, I think the issue of the renaming is, is one of looking at subjective versus objective facts, right? When we really look at this and, and we look at the name. And so, yes, of course, it's been, it's, we really appreciate that you've been advised that some of the street names may cause confusion. I'm not sure this is one of them, though. And I would ask, I would respectfully ask this council to look at the details of that and say, what, what really is the risk here in this particular circumstance? Um, you know, second, I might add to, to clarify the issue of the petition is that when we were first approached, the committee was going to submit Stagecoach Road. The community is 100% against any name change, but we also went out out of deference to voting and being community members to ask if, in fact, we were to lose uh, uh, that uh, uh, appeal, if you will, or that recommendation, would we want that? And about 30% of the residents, if I'm right about that? Somewhere around 30%, that was the mass consensus we got uh, for Horizon. So nobody's happy uh, with any of the different names. But that's why it was done that way, not because there was support, but because we 
just looked and asked for a particular alternative, uh, being good citizens of the street. Um, you know, finally, another comment that was made in the last meeting that I wanted uh, to rectify uh, that John, you had made is, you know, the, the group asked, are there any businesses on Kelly Road? And I think the answer was, well, no, there's just some home businesses. Well, I, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my home business, if, if I could for a second. Certainly. Um, because I'm pretty proud of it. You know, small businesses, there are 1.2 million businesses in the U.S. that have over 10 and less than 500 employees, and I'm one of them. And it's a business I started here in Londonderry. I picked Londonderry. I run a software business. I started in 2009 out of my house. Everybody works out of the home, and we have 17 part-time and full-time employees, and we're a software company. We also have some pretty big clients with pretty big legal departments. And we sell low-cost software. So as you can imagine, we need lots of clients, and it's pretty low margin to compete out there today. So we sell software to some pretty big companies, including General Motors. Uh, we sell software to Samsung in 17 countries. We have international clients. We have agreements that I need people to translate for me because that's the new global economy. And so I would ask in support of small business here in Londonderry and, and support of the small business economy and maybe even interestingly some of the things we we heard earlier about the creative class and what kind of businesses we want here in Londonderry. I would ask for the support that this name change will cost real money. So because of these agreements, if you've experienced them, I don't get to write them. I have to take my client's agreements and pretty much sign them. I have to name attorneys in those agreements. Any change has to come from an attorney, not from me. And when clients have to review that, it's a chance to open up Pandora's box on those agreements and then maybe come back to me and want to change some other terms related to those agreements. And I have a lot of agreements, so I support a lot of small engagements rather than a few large engagements in my software company. It makes it quite, quite expensive to do that uh, these days. With over 100 agreements with the time of attorneys, I cannot simply do it myself. I have to engage third parties to do that. Uh, one of my staff is a part-time bookkeeper here in Londonderry who's a mom who I was looking to add more hours to this year. This will pretty much kill that opportunity. So I would ask, when, when I get calls from local politicians and state politicians, I get told I'm a job creator. Seems everybody's telling me that because I had an idea for a small business that I've grown to 17 people. It's not 100, but it's 17 people. And I get told I'm a job creator. And so, and I get asked by people all the time, what, what can I do to help? Well, um, I know you're not asking that tonight, but I would like to respectfully posit that one of the things that the town can do that would help is not create unnecessary expenses and changes. And I think you'll hear there are other businesses on the street. So it's really not a home business of just one person working out of the house. The home business of the future is companies of everyone working out of their houses. And that's what you have here in Londonderry and my company that I chose to locate here uh, back a number of years ago. I wanted to thank you very much for your consideration this evening. And again, I respectfully ask that you not rename uh, Kelly Road tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Would there be anybody else who would like to come to the microphone and speak? And so if you could please just give us your name and your address so that we, for the record. Good evening. Dolores Stocklosa, 6 Kelly Road. Thank you. Hi. Um, Ryder did a, a wonderful job of, of um, summarizing some of the issues that we've been concerned about with the change and we're not suggesting that Kelly Ave change their name either we are saying that we don't recognize that there is a problem and we don't believe that there uh, needs to be a change for either of the roads I understand that when companies or even when towns need to make a decision they do a cost-benefit analysis they look at the cost and how that balances with the benefit and when we look at a cost-benefit analysis, I'm just going to use an analogy of the lights that were put at the corner of Litchfield and Mammoth. It came as a great, um, a significant cost for us to install those lights and fix that intersection, but we did it because there were numerous accidents there, and it became, you know, a really big problem for the town. And, and it was an expense, but it was worth it because of the benefit. And now things work smoothly. But the town did not go ahead and spend many thousands of dollars to put an intersection, I mean, I'm sorry, to put a traffic light at every single intersection on Mammoth Road. So there isn't one down the street or up the street, even though there still exists the possibility that there could be an accident. We don't say there is no danger. There is no need for a light. There will never be an accident. There will never be a problem. But we weigh the cost and the <coughs> benefits. So 
I believe that if this were going to cost the town a significant amount of money, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So I hope that council members will be sensitive to the residents of Kelly Road and the significant cost in money and in time and effort and labor and aggravation that it's going to cost us for what we believe is a very insignificant benefit, if any, because we have not seen, there have been, according to people who have lived there a long time, two homes that burned to the ground and it, there was never a confusion over the, over, you know, the location. And um, if, um, if there's a problem on Kelly Ave, most likely that call is going to go to Manchester. If you don't know you're at the airport, the, the difference between these uh, streets and other streets that have been renamed is we're looking at a small part of the street with three businesses versus another small street with many residences. They are two very different places. Um, and I don't believe that if you make the change that you will give us a 100% guarantee that there will never be a confusion if there's we in need, if we are in need of emergency responders and that there will never be a problem. And it seems to me if then there is a problem, that opens you up for litigation. Um, so I thank you for listening to our um, arguments and I hope you will consider the significant cost that it will be for us. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Melissa Neiman. I live at 7 Kelly Road. Um, so I think Ryder really did sort of um, capture a lot. I also am a small business on Kelly Road. Um, and so I have two, I have sort of two thoughts that I sort of wanted to throw out there. One is I agree with him. I'm actually in the same boat, except I am a consultant for um, a lot of um, federal contracts. I have, um, I'm a UN vendor. I have a lot of international contracts, and I am in the same boat. <laughs> um, some of those contracts, you go through that process, it takes six months just to even get through the process. And then by then, um, if I have to change my address, it's going to cost, and I have other people that I pay down the road, so of course, it opens you up for a lot of other issues. So um, I'm not gonna repeat everything, but I'm in exactly the same boat he's in, in terms okay. of my small business. However, two things that I sort of have heard throughout these arguments are the two things I wanted to bring up. The first one is on the issue of Kelly Ave. I don't know about you guys. I've, my husband has <coughs> lived in Londonderry since he was four years old, and I've been in Londonderry for 15 years. And um, when I used to drive home, I take Perimeter Road, right? If I come off Brown Ave, you take Perimeter Road, and you would be like right there, and you could just pop on Litchfield, and then I was at Kelly. Um, how, many, well, how many street roads do I go through now after they made the change? Like, the street actually changes names like three different times if I take that same exact route because I go through the circle and everything like that, which is fine. I'm making the point that Kelly Ave may not be Kelly Ave if we're talking about all this industry that we're going to be bringing around and things will change, businesses will come in if we're going to be building around the airport and bringing in more business and sort of reframing how we're thinking about that. It is sort of the jewel of uh, how business and industry will come in and that will restructure how we work around the airport, it'll restructure roads, it'll restructure how we have things coming in and out. So Kelly Ave may not be Kelly Ave in the next three to five years. Whereas Kelly Road, being residential, will probably stay, should it stay with its name, Kelly Road for a very, very long time. So I think that's probably a consideration that should be in here, although I'm not, you guys are not here to change the name for Kelly Ave. Um, but Kelly Ave may not be Kelly Ave for much longer. Something to consider. The other part is, I used to work for an airline um, way back. Sounds weird saying that, but I used to work for an airline way back. And one of the things we had to do, or one of the arguments I've heard, is that a lot of the emergency manuals and emergency structures and all of these things have to be changed. My job as a supervisor at an airline was to update all of the manuals as every single time an update came through. Well, I can tell you that happened about every <coughs> month, two months, three months, because there would always be a new regulation that would come through, there was always a new update that would come through, and you literally had to go through, find the new one, or take the old one out, put the new revisions in. 
And while I understand that that's an expense in that you have to print paper and somebody's got to take the time to update the manuals, it's not nearly as big of an expense as some of the small businesses on our street would have to incur. So updating manuals happens anyway. I hope that Manchester Airport is updating their emergency um, manuals as well as all the other <coughs> cities and towns that answer emergency calls as often as they have to and should be so that we know that there's always going to be a proper response. So I just wanted to address those two arguments and echo again the same sentiment that everyone else is sort of putting forth. Thanks. Thank you, Melissa. Would anyone else like to comment? I just have something brief to say. Certainly. My name is Lisa Tramarini, and I live at 10 Kelly Road. And I just want to address the brush fire that was brought up in 2008. Certainly. That was my husband who burnt a gypsy moth nest that was this big off one of our trees at the bottom of our driveway on the gravel. So it was not a big brush fire. <laughs> when um, the gentleman came, he laughed and said, I don't know who called. We had stepped it out. It, everyone burns gypsy moth nests off their tree. So that was not a big emergency. I've lived on Kelly Road for 27 years. I personally watched the two houses burn down. There was no confusion. One was directly across the street from me. One was a couple of uh, streets up. I have known people on this street. Like I said, I've lived there for 27 years. And I personally, anytime I tell anyone my address, I am very specific because all of us who live on Kelly Road are aware <coughs> that there's a Kelly Avenue. And so when we give our address, it's K-E-L-L-E-Y Road. Uh, you know, I, I, the confusion on, on the fact that there's all residents on Kelly Road and all businesses on Kelly Avenue, if someone calls and says, I have a problem at my home, it's, it's a non-issue, in my opinion. But I just wanted to speak on the, the brush fire. Thank you. Because that was at my house. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. You. Is there anything else? Hi, I'm Hi. Deborah Lack. I live at 22 Kelly Road, and Hello. I apologize. I'm reading from uh, some notes because I a few different people couldn't be here, so I'm kind of bringing that. Sure. I did want to give a history on the uh, a, a closer <coughs> history on the name of choosing Horizon Road. What we did was we circulated the name list that had been given in earlier meetings from the Historical Commission, as well as taking suggestions. And because there was so little consensus, those were the two that got the most votes. It didn't even mean that they got chosen or that they were liked by 30% of the residents. It's that only 30% of the residents would even deign to choose a second choice. And of those, those two got the most votes, which then got brought to John uh, and the committee. And then they voted of the top two names. So just clarification on that. Saying that we liked Horizon Road or that we liked Delp Road or that we liked Stagecoach Road, it, it, we haven't actually had a full-on, uh, full community vote because uh, uh, Dolly and I ran up and down the street in bad weather, you know, doing all kinds of crazy mailbox stuffing just to try to find people's names and when they were home to get responses from people. And most of what we got was we're not, we don't want to change Kelly Road not even willingness to vote on another name. So if we actually did have to change it, we'd actually have to go out to the whole street and say, what really could you live with? Because Horizon Road doesn't represent that. So I feel okay. compelled to share that with you all. Thank um, you. The other, the other uh, thing that I wanted to say was that um, a number of people who couldn't be here are parents who couldn't, uh, couldn't uh, get childcare or have issues because the power's out right now. Um, Sorry about that. Um, yeah. None of us are happy about that. Yeah, no, it's, it's not a lot of fun. But, um, but one of them specifically is home with her five children, and she is a lifetime resident. She was raised in that house. And um, you'll find on the petition that she wrote a specific note saying that she was hoping that her children would have the same uh, address that she did when she was growing up. Um, we, uh, we, we would have been able to, um, OK. Would that be um, Ms. MacArthur? Uh, that's actually uh, Sonia Marino. Okay. Um, um, so uh, we've clarified there are, in fact, two historical residents. There are businesses. I just want to add, you know, my husband was fairly modest. The, the legal departments he's talking about are uh, Google, Disney, um, you know, General Motors, uh, General Dynamics, big, huge 
many contracts. Um, but aside from that, additionally, he got a check the other day from an Italian company that took 18 months to be issued. Now, mail forwarding only lasts for, what, six months? So if we were to submit a a, an address change to some of the clients who have started saying payable six months out, nine months out, the level of checks that he would not be receiving, because we all know how well uh, mail, de mail delivery works 100% of the time. Um, you know, I'm, my brother is in Salem forwarding his mail that's supposed to come to me because they couldn't distinguish with two people with the last name that's the same. So my, my nail from my bank is going to my brother's new address. So that you can see the level of reassurance we have about if we have to change our address to get checks from businesses that have a, an outlying pay period in addition to these small businesses. I needed to make that point. The other thing I wanted to say is that um, if you actually look at the, at the uh, point made in the letter that you all uh, referenced, uh, it says, I believe in the best interest of the airport, the Carter bears the same name in mo both municipal jurisdictions. You know, maybe other people aren't suggesting that that's the one that could change, but Manchester has a Keller Street, a Kelly Street, and a Kelly Avenue, and they don't seem to have a problem with this. So, you know, it, it could be that as an airport, if the airport feels like it's important to be consistent, maybe they want to do something like staging road, but that's, that's just me and my personal, um, you know, really worrying about that. I don't do well speaking in front of lots of people, and I'm sure I'm forgetting lots of things I wanted to say, but um, I do want to thank everyone for, for spending lots of time trying to, to work on making us safer, but, um, but I, I don't personally believe that it does that. Um, and, uh, you know, when we talk about um, what's going on, I, I think uh, having people who've been living here for 20 plus years, if you polled the residents on who's been there, uh, 20 years plus and who feels like it's really important to be consistent and identity-wise, personal-wise, I think um, that should count for something that, that a lot of people really, you know, we all would prefer that it remain the same. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak this evening? Yes, sir, please come forward. <clears throat> Hello. Hi, my name's David Nimon, uh, Seven Kelly as well. I just had a few issues that I wanted to bring up as possibilities. Certainly. Uh, first of all, um, I grew up in Londonderry. I've been here since I was four. I grew up on Anderson Circle, which doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> it's now Horseshoe Lane, I guess. I, I uh, kind of feel a bit like my identity was erased <laughs> in, in some regards in that, in that instance. But even that makes a little bit more sense with Anderson Lane and Anderson Circle because uh, they're both residential areas. Uh, one thing that I noticed in driving around is that um, the rally points for the law enforcement and the fire, there's a lot of signs on Mammoth Road as well as the end of uh, South Willow Street. None of them say Kelly Road. They say rally point this way, follow the white and blue sign if you're law enforcement and then I believe there's a different color scheme for the fire department and I also am aware that they do drill and do mock runs and bring representatives from other neighboring communities that would be assisting with mutual aid in the case of a major issue at Manchester Airport. And so that they are aware, I very strongly doubt that a yellow Oshkosh from CFR, Crash Fire Rescue from Manchester will be going up my street anytime soon. Uh, I just really uh, don't relish the idea of changing the name because though there's very little, if any, confusion now between Kelly Ave and Kelly Road, I believe that if my road becomes Horizon Road, I'm going to be doing a lot of explaining on where that is. <laughs> and right now, if I order a pizza, it finds me. <laughs> but I think if you change the name, it's not going to. Uh, just because the GPS issues, maps, everything that exists up until from 1920 to today has said Kelly Road. So changing it for the off chance that someone might get sued just seems a little uh, ridiculous to me, and that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else with further comment on the Kelly Road resolution? Yes, sir. My name is Bob MacArthur, 19 Kelly Road. 
Hello. I used to take flying lessons on Kelly Ave, and never once did I get confused on where I was going. Uh, I don't feel as though that we're, um, there's three businesses, four businesses on Kelly Road, on Kelly Ave. There's none with signage on Kelly Road. One's in Manchester, one's in Um And I really feel as though everyone that lives on Kelly Road has been there for, you know, my wife's been there for 33 years. And I don't want her to get lost coming home. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any further comment? Okay, see, yes, Brian. Um, just want to remind the council one thing that uh, I think the town employs me for is uh, prevention, um, preventing accidents and, you know, things from happening to our residents. Um, one of the residents stated that they spell Kelly Road when they're designating where they live. Um, when you're having a medical problem, such as a stroke, something like that, um, you're not able to do stuff like that. Um, I understand everyone keeps talking about the legal issues. My concern is the safety issues, whether it be Kelly Road, Kelly Ave. You know, we went through this with Harvey Hardy. You know, <laughs> my job is to keep the residents safe. That's why we brought this up. Um, there, to me, if we can save one life, prevent one fire, there is no cost to that. You know, I mean, we can't put a price on a life. So that's our stand on it. And that's, you know, like I said, I feel bad. I know the legal issues, but, and I know the town's gonna look at the legal issues. Our concern is the residents that live on that street. Um, anyone that drives down Kelly Road, Kelly Ave, um, you know, we have, you know, we've had multiple brush fires today. And, you know, not everybody lives on the road that they're calling from, where it's coming from a cell phone. So we just, that's our stand on, you know, trying to clarify the, you know, confusion before it happens. Thank you. Yes, sir. Am I allowed a second turn or am I? It, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'm sorry. I just, I felt con compelled to respond to that. But thank you very much for those comments. I really appreciate you keeping us safe. And, and, and I hope you show up if I have a brush fire because I don't want to make you mad. But, um, <laughs> but, but I, I have to object to the comment because... To say that if someone's having a medical emergency, well, I can't spell Horizon or Stagecoach Road if I'm having a heart attack and all I can do is dial, you're relying on E911 anyway. And, and we're getting a cell tower and we're going to be the closest to that. We're going to be the most accurate in, in the town. <laughs> I, I think, you know, it, but again, this is what I meant by subjective versus objective criteria. You always have to spell your street. We all have issues of where we're saying. And if what you're saying is true, then you must change Litchfield. This is a slippery slope argument, because now you're going to be confused. Am I Litch? Am I which side of Litchfield am I on? There's main streets in every town. We're going down a slippery slope argument that it's it's not helping me. It goes back to Reagan's comment, right? We're from the government. We're here to help. You know, it's an issue where you, you just cannot r prevent risk altogether. You just can't do it, no matter what the name is. And so I appreciate your example, but in that particular example, no street could be spelled over the phone. No name. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, um, is there, just let me finish with the public, Joe, and then I'll come back to the council. Yes, is there anyone else from the public? Sir. Uh, Absolutely, sir. Good evening. <clears throat> uh, my name's Tim Scott. I'm from New Hampshire 911, officially the Bureau of Emergency Communications. Uh, I'll state right up, this is not my favorite part of this job. <coughs> I don't relish coming into uh, a town where, where I don't live and, and you know, s spelling out how we think should be run. Uh, I do want to commend the town and the residents. Um, this has been one of the more um, well thought out responses uh, from, from a group of residents and, and they've brought up some valid points and that's, that's the most we can ask from. Um, I wanted to just give a, a quick recap of, of why we recommended some of these things and then just address some of the points that were made. And, um, and leave the board up to that. <clears throat> um, we initially made the recommendations. We're going through the entire state. Um, part of the what we do is, is collecting GPS data and GIS data for, for next generation 911. 
but our addressing recommendations that, that came to Londonderry and to other cities and towns in the state uh, are based on the most common problems and sources of confusion. And by and large, they're out of sequence addressing, uh, odds and evens on the same side of the road, or, or usually lot-based addressing, um, inconsistent uh, increments <clears throat> where numbers increase greatly and then don't increase. Those can be confusing. And <clears throat> similar sounding or identical road names. Those are the biggest issues that, that we find cause confusion, especially with mutual aid situations when you've got someone coming in to the town who's not familiar with it. <clears throat> also, it's easy to confuse a similar road name when you're communicating an address over radio. Um, you know, the computer equipment we have, the GIS systems we have, <clears throat> this information is coming in and it's as accurate as can be on the screen, but you still have to relay that over radio at some point today. So we find, um, you know, we find that that's the most common. So we're not saying this is every possible confusing address in the town. We're just saying these are in the categories that we find uh, mostly cause confusion. Um, our uh, recommendations, as best as we can plan out, I like to refer to them as the 100-year recommendation. It's if, if we're going to recommend that uh, a town changes an address, we want to feel confident that <clears throat> for the foreseeable future, for, for a massive upswing in development, that the address is going to be valid and this isn't going to have to change again. Can we guarantee that? Of course not. But that's what our standards are based on, is to allow for a more than reasonable amount of development and more than reasonable amount of change and the addressing system will hold, hold true. So um, having, uh, having said all that, uh, I know a couple issues were brought up. There were multiple Kelly Streets in Manchester. Uh, I will say Manchester is on the list for us to collect and analyze. So uh, while they don't have a letter from us currently, although we probably have a, we probably have a letter to them on the street names. So uh, they've been issued a letter on, on duplicate street names, but not the full uh, address by address list that the town of Londonderry has. Um, uh, the uh, mail forwarding will last by default for 12 months. So any address that is changed, that will hold for 12 months. It can be extended, but that's the, um, that is the default uh, length of time. And uh, I guess i just wrap up here. I don't want to take too much time in saying that um, while it is my job to be here and, and to talk about this, um, I, from what we, we see in the call center, that, uh, again, these are the kind of addressing changes that do cause confusion. And, uh, and I personally believe that uh, if we implemented these kind of changes and standardized addressing across the state, uh, can I, we're going to save a life on Kelly Ave versus Kelly Road? I, I don't know. But will we save lives over the course of the state by implementing standard addresses for the whole state? Absolutely, 100%. Okay. So Jim, please hold there for one moment. Yes, to the council, please. Yes, go yeah, ahead, Jeff. Um, just p playing devil's advocate for a second. Um, why do you think Kelly Road and Kelly Avenue sound the same, besides the first word? Uh, <clears throat> this is going to be a very technical answer, but um, part of the, uh, the federal guidelines for E911 was to establish, um, and I don't want to use the word, but city-style addressing, uh, which is a number and a road name and a street suffix. So uh, per national guidelines, it's an identical road name with only a different suffix. So I guess to further the question, when you provide the uh, address to um, emergency response, it's Kelly Road as in road, and then Kelly Avenue as an avenue. Correct. Okay. That's all. Um, Tom Dolan. Um, thank you for coming. Um, question, we heard from Brian about the example about the brush fire uh, a few years ago that had, a, had an issue. Uh, and, and you've spoken about the naming conventions and the theory behind it. Do you have any data or history, or I don't even know if you collect that, of, of uh, of incidences of confusion between these two roads that are on the on the table tonight, between Kelly Road and Kelly Avenue and Londonderry, do you have you know how many times it's ever been confused at the at the E911 uh, on, on on Kelly Road and Kelly Ave? No, I, I I don't have any stats on that for you, unfortunately. No. Is it that we don't collect stats, or that we just haven't had confusion? We um we have a we have a daily log of all the. Uh, incidences that uh, require more assistance than a, than a standard call and response and no problem but we don't run stats uh, I mean that would be something we could we could look into but I don't have it in a, in a easily accessible database to pull up for you no I, I can tell you it would it would be more helpful to a board like us if you like we heard the 
well, we have a, a case X number of years ago where we had a brush fire and we had some confusion. The captain was here and the fire truck was here. If, if your agency could bring down some data that said, you know, on average over the last five years we've had, we get two instances of confusion and here's how it gets confused, that would help us. Uh, otherwise, you leave us in a situation where we're, we're trying to theorize what might happen based on on some maybe some guidelines. Not to say that they're invalid, but it, the the hard data is helps us make a decision better than the theoretical, you know, what if. So I, I guess I, I don't know if the if the call center is uh, enabled or funded to collect that type of data, but I could I could tell you that it would help someone like me sitting in a chair like this make better decisions if you could bring forth that data. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Tom. John. Has there been any street that uh, was set for a name change that the council said no to? There was the, we had recommended changing both the Hardy and Hovey roads. Uh, that recommend, that uh, resolution uh, did, not, uh, did not pass. Thanks. Jim, do you have any questions? Well, <clears throat> I think that <coughs> You know, I'm trying to put myself into a 911 situation for the residents versus business. And I would, my experience, and I've been in law enforcement for a brief period of time, is I had found that when we get 911 calls from residents, it was more garbled and more confusing than if you got a 911 call from, from a, a business. Uh, businesses are, are more clearly defined than residences. Uh, I know it would be a big job to change Kelly Ave. Uh, I think the, the municipalities that come to Kelly Ave on emergencies know where they're going and they do know where their stations are regardless of whether or not we change that name or, or not. So I, I, I would like to hear what uh, our legal counsel has to say on it before I vote on this. Is there any further comment from the public? I just have a question about uh, how long 911 has been doing these changes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're going to have to come up. And, okay. and, and the reason why you have to come up is, is that when the people are watching at home, they need to be able to hear what you're saying. Okay. Because we have a huge audience. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> my, my question was just simply, how long has this been going on? that we've been changing the names in, in New Hampshire? Um, we've been working with uh, towns and cities since 1994. Uh, originally, our, uh, our mission was to work with approximately city different, uh, 60 different towns that had no addressing uh, other than rural routes. <clears throat> and so that's, that's where we had that. So once we had worked with those towns and, and got them um, a, like I said, a city style address with your, with your number and your street name and a suffix. Uh, we started moving to other towns to uh, collect their addressing system into a system with problems. And <clears throat> our role basically is to identify everything that, that we believe is a <clears throat> potential s a source of confusion, a, a common source of confusion. Uh, and then we bring them before cities and towns and discussions like these and leave it up to the, the town attorneys and, and governing body to decide is this something that's, that's li how, how much of a liability is it and decide if the town wants to live with it or not. So I assume you're going through alphabetically? Uh, no, we're going through in order of uh, requests for assistance with, uh, with mapping and with addressing. Okay. It's just, I was a, in law enforcement in 1998 in Campton and uh, we had to go through this, uh, which was odd just because there was a limited number of law enforcement officers and we all knew the town like the back of our hand so changing the names was actually more confusing than than not but uh, it just seems to me that if we've been going over 10 12 years of, of knowing there's a problem and not doing anything about it then it doesn't seem like there's a real red hot reason to do it now <laughs> right well I mean there, there has I mean there's this confusion you know I, I can tell you we, we have a confusing situation almost every day and in fact there was a um, I believe there was a confusing situation here in London Dairy on reporting to a house fire Mm -hmm. Was that, uh, is that, am I correct in that, a couple of years ago? I'm, yeah, we've, um, we've had multiple incidents, um, you know, you're looking at different, this isn't, Kelly Road isn't the first one we've done. Londonderry has been changing street names for quite a few years now. Um, Whispering Pines has been totally renamed. 
uh, Anderson Lane, Anderson Circle, uh, which is sort of the same thing as the Kelly Road, Kelly Ave, mm -hmm. Anderson Lane, Anderson Circle. I would argue against uh, that. Well, when somebody calls, they don't say I'm in a house. We get an address. That's it. We don't know if it's residential. We don't know if it's commercial. Well, Someone's having a, a poll and that automatically goes and lights up a panel. And but when they're having a medical problem, they don't pull a poll station. They call 911. And 911 gives us an address. That's why we changed uh, Anderson Circle to Horseshoe Lane. Um, and Spring Road was one that was broken up into different sections. Uh, we did have confusion with mutual aid coming to a house fire. Um, and they all plugged into their GPSs, Spring Road, and it brought them to the wrong place. And Spring Road has been that way for since I've been in this town in 74. So <laughs> the GPSs were wrong to start. Um, so I think that might be what you're referring to as the Spring Road fire. But we have had other instances on uh, Griffin Road, Griffin Ave, uh, which is something else I believe the committee's looking at. Um, we've had instances with Anderson Circle, Anderson Lane, that's why that was changed. So there have been roads already changed, and it was done, I believe, before I got on the committee, Correct. sort of prioritized the list. And it takes time, as you see, going through each street. Um, other communities, such as Pelham, uh, which might have been easier on the committee, but as far as I know, it has been a nightmare for the residents. Pelham went through, picked every street they wanted to change. They picked a date, and every street changed in one day. That's what Campton and did. That and that was, was utter confusion. Horrible. So I think the committee's trying to do it in sections and by priority, and try to give as least confusion as possible to the residents and the emergency services. Yeah, my point is just that it's been like this for years and years and years, and there hasn't been much confusion to speak of, and so it doesn't really seem like it's, it's a hot burning issue that needs to be addressed. See, I, I, I beg to differ where if there's an opportunity to eliminate confusion and prevent an issue, that's why we're doing this. Um, nobody thought Spring Road was an issue until we burnt the house down. Well, that sounds then like it was, it was a GPS a, issue rather than a, a, a town issue. Okay, gentlemen. All right, so, I, think yeah. we, I, think, <laughs> I, think, I think we've exhausted that one. Thank so, you. But, but, so thank you very much.